a wilderness of wind and rock, one of Europe's last wild places, a hunting ground for some of the world's most magnificent birds. In the highlands of Scotland, the golden eagle stands supreme. Hooked beak, sharp claws, strong wings, keen eyes. He's equipped to kill to survive. But this has brought eagles into conflict with man. For centuries, birds of prey have been both admired and persecuted to extinction. But with more sympathetic understanding, they're fighting back and are seen not just as competitors, but for what they are. Impressive at rest, spectacular in flight. All wildlife needs space to survive. And in the harsh world of the high tops, mountain hares are spread thinly, so eagles must range far in search of food. Golden eagles are one of Europe's largest birds. But by soaring on their seven-foot wingspan in mountain updrafts, they expend little energy in their endless quest for prey. When the eagle seeks the hare, predators and prey create a so-called balance of nature, which is in fact a web of dependency. Each must feed on the other if they and their living space are to flourish. So paradoxically, when hunter and hunted come together, survival is the result. Death for the hare means life for this male eagle, and food for his mate, who needs to increase her body weight before she can produce eggs. This extra weight makes her less efficient at hunting, so she becomes increasingly dependent upon him for food. Despite the snows of early March, egg laying is imminent. And since the largest birds of prey take the longest to raise their young, they're the first to nest. With the highland winter in retreat, the largest migrant birds of prey are already on their way from Africa. Among them is a very special bird, one which was driven away from Scotland in the 19th century, but after nearly 50 years, returned successfully. The osprey. On arrival from Africa, an osprey needs to recover its condition, and pike are easy prey. Like the osprey, pike are also predators of fish. But while hunting in the shallows, they're vulnerable to attack from above, and the predator becomes the prey.
Apart from food, nest sites are vital to all birds of prey. And as they're often traditional, passed on from generation to generation, they're a focus of springtime activity. Like many large species, each osprey is faithful to its nest site, returning there year after year. So the same pair may breed together for several seasons, though first attempts at mating are often disrupted by intruding ospreys. The pair try to defend the nest site by using special calls and aggressive flight and attempts by intruding males at site takeovers, or rape, are vigorously resisted. the dogfight was in earnest. For with a five-month investment in breeding each year, the resident male wants to be the one who passes on his genes. So he mates as frequently as possible, maybe 200 times in the three weeks up to egg laying. Food shortage may make her unreceptive, even encourage her to seek another mate. So he must weigh the advantages of feeding her against the risks of absence while hunting. Ospreys, in fact all life, depends on energy from the sun. And it's the plants which convert this energy that create the pyramid of life. The plants feed the insects that feed the trout, which, for the fishing osprey at the top of the pyramid, is an irresistible target. Fishing success might be only one dive in six and take up to two hours. So while her mate is away, the female repairs the nest and defends it from intruders. She also attends to the eggs and small chicks, while her mate provides the food, a division of duties used by most birds of prey. And we know from the ringing of many ospreys that breeding success is related to experience. So pairs that have bred together before, like these two, are more successful than first-timers. So quality of parents, nest sites and food supply are the major factors that determine how many chicks are produced. And this pair should add three more young to the continuing recolonization of the Scottish Highlands. But not all birds of prey are monogamous like eagles and ospreys. Some practice polygamy, and April on the heather moors is the setting for some spectacular female aerobatics. Female hen harriers live longer than males and outnumber them. So it's the females who must sometimes attract a mate, even if they have to share him with several others. 
These displays also serve to establish territory, and the sprig of heather she's carrying advertises her intentions. For a female, this system of polygamy shows profit and loss. Sharing a mate, at least she raises some young. Without him, none at all. But such flashing displays can attract less welcome attention. A peregrine falcon. These skirmishes are seldom serious, but when birds of prey share the same hunting ground, even if not the same prey, animosity always lingers. Unlike peregrines, harriers hunt small birds and mammals, slowly quartering the ground on long, buoyant wings. But there is yet another moorland predator sharing the open hillsides, one which also has a hooked beak and sharp eyes. Like the harrier, the short-eared owl's flattened face maximizes vision and hearing. And though not closely related to the harriers, owls are true birds of prey. The presence of both owl and harrier in the same habitat shows how design for a common purpose can produce birds of great similarity. Science calls it convergent evolution, and the similarities don't end there. Both owl and harrier nest on the ground, but only the owl depends on field voles when breeding. The snag is, vole numbers vary from year to year, so owls are only plentiful in years when there are plenty of voles. The young owls are of different ages. Some are quite large, even when eggs are still unhatched. And there's a good reason for this. Birds that depend on fluctuating food supplies lay large clutches of eggs which are incubated from the first laid. Then if the food fails, only the youngest chicks may die. And in a good year, all may survive. When voles are plentiful, they're left within reach of the chicks, so they can help themselves. But it doesn't take long for the female to hunt successfully and return to feed and protect them. In a good year, as many as a dozen chicks can be raised. But when vole numbers decline, the adults become nomadic, wandering over large areas of the uplands in search of the little rodents. But this year, there is no shortage. Foxes and crows are a daily hazard, so when the male isn't hunting, he stands guard nearby. When food is plentiful, the female ensures the weakest get their share. The more precocious help themselves.
By feeding round the clock, short-eared owls bridge the gap between the day and night hunters. So by late evening, when most birds of prey have gone to roost, the lowland woods echo to the calls that announce the coming of darkness, and the night watch takes over. The tawny owl has large round eyes for spotting its prey, but at night, its keen ears assess the direction and range of telltale sounds. A ghostly hunter, designed for darkness, each wing beat muffled by feathers, so soft that the wood mouse hears nothing, until it's too late. By dawn, the night hunting owl has returned to roost, leaving the woods to the day hunting hawks. These summer woods are alive with insects, providing not just food for the residents, but drawing millions of migrant songbirds from Africa, prey for the specialist bird catchers, such as sparrow hawks. Like all woodland hawks, they have short round wings and long tails for manoeuvring between the trees more swiftly than their prey. The agile male does most of the hunting early in the breeding season and calls the female off the nest to receive the food. She is much larger than her mate, and intriguingly, the faster the prey, the more pronounced is this size difference. So this means the bird-chasing sparrowhawk is able to hunt a wider range of prey. The male hunts small to medium-sized birds. She will pursue them up to the size of wood pigeons. But when the chicks are well grown, both parents concentrate on the annual feast of fledglings. Almost all animals time their breeding to coincide with such food abundance, and birds of prey are no exception. While the insects attract summer songbirds, so these migrants themselves draw birds of prey from Africa, and southern heaths become their stronghold. On warm summer days, hobbies gather at such places, but here, their quarry is not birds, but dragonflies. The hobby is a true falcon, its long pointed wings producing the speed for catching prey in open country. Later in the summer, hobbies use their prowess as bird catchers to snatch young swallows and house martins, even swifts, using sheer speed. 
but on sunny summer days, these heathland ponds provide easier hunting. Unfortunately for many heathland specialists, this habitat is one of the most threatened in Europe. Most has already been destroyed, forcing hobbies out. And though they are still able to breed on farmland, albeit at lower density, intensive farming has not proved so kind to one of our best loved birds of prey, the pale hunter of marsh and meadow. dawn in the English countryside of Constable, a land of clean rivers, lush pastures and old trees, home to one of the natural world's most beautiful hunters, the barn owl. Barn owls are the beneficiaries of yesterday's farming breeding in derelict barns and cottages. From these secret corners, the waking owls sail out over the water meadows, using both eyesight and hearing to seek out mice and voles. But times have changed. Barn owls now find such watercolor landscapes increasingly rare. Forced to hunt in less suitable habitat, they face a food shortage. And in times of hardship, especially cold winters, many die. Even floating on silent wings over these rich meadows, finding food is seldom easy. And out in the bare prairies that intensive farming has created, the sight of a hunting owl is becoming increasingly rare. Sadly, the old meadows and their drifting owls are bedded under mountains of surplus cereals, created by an international system of subsidies. But yet again, the situation is changing. Economists predict that by the year 2000, food consumption will have fallen, 
and the European community are now enforcing tough new policies to reduce production. So wildlife may yet benefit from a return to more sympathetic farming. Already farmers are adjusting production or risking bankruptcy, much as birds of prey must adapt or die. And one has already adapted to man's creations with great success. The Kestrel's traditional hunting ground used to be those same lush meadows favored by the barn owl, but so little rough grassland is left that they've learned to live with the traffic and exploit their most unique feature. Hovering is an ideal way to search motorway verges, giving the Kestrel time to spot mouse, worm, or beetle. Due partly to this varied diet and adaptability, the kestrel is now Europe's commonest bird of prey, though their exploitation of the new landscapes of modern Britain doesn't stop at the grass verge. The kestrel has become an urban falcon, with a streetwise eye for a high-rise home, even in the heart of London. Lofty window ledges replace traditional cliff ledges, and even the smallest park has a sparrow or two for food. And kestrels are not alone in becoming city dwellers. Even those wildest of birds, the pigeon-eating peregrine, now nests in cities like New York. But however adaptable the species, birds of prey will die if the laws passed by the world's parliaments do not protect wildlife and the environment. And these laws must be enforced. In Britain, despite protective legislation, special habitats are still destroyed, rivers polluted, birds of prey trapped, poisoned and shot. Man's exploitation of the world has not created, but wasted. In Britain, the ploughing of the flow country to produce massed ranks of conifers of questionable economic value. Our marshes drained, ancient woodland felled, the seas polluted, marginal land developed. But not all such schemes are harmful. Planted in the right place, conifers are profitable, and in time, Wildlife moves in and birds of prey follow, taking advantage of the new nest sites and food supply. Among them, the goshawk, largest of the world's true hawks and widespread throughout the northern woodlands of Europe and America. Centuries ago, the felling of woodland followed by persecution meant goshawks ceased to breed in Britain and they had to be reintroduced they are slowly recolonizing. Slowly, because the gamekeeper's hostility persists due to the hawk's occasional attacks on pheasants. Goshawks are impressive predators, fast and powerful, striking down large birds like crows and wood pigeons, or even full-grown rabbits, if they can catch them. In a few places, goshawks are doing well, but the rising tide of conifers is a mixed blessing. Despite helping our largest hawk, 
they are harming our smallest falcon. The merlin is a tiny hunter, not much bigger than a thrush, but it's fast, a dashing chaser of small birds in the uplands of Britain. The male does most of the hunting during the nesting season, passing prey to the female in a ritual which suggests there is some risk to his health. The female has a favorite rock on which to pluck the prey before delivering it to her chick. Most merlins nest on the ground in rank heather, but this old crow's nest provides an admirable alternative. The youngster is a lone survivor from four chicks. This pair's failure and the widespread decline of merlins is a complex problem, caused in part by afforestation, environmental poisons, and the loss of heather moorland, the merlin's favored habitat. These unspoilt upland valleys between Heather Moor and Hill Farm are important hunting grounds, but subsidized farming and forestry has destroyed much of this habitat, driving merlins out. Birds of prey illustrate more dramatically than any other our impact on the environment, so often bad, but sometimes good. Ironically, it was man who made these open hillsides in the first place by cutting down the trees and inadvertently created ideal habitat for the long-winged falcons. Felling of the trees encouraged heather to grow and grouse to breed, providing a quarry for the world's most perfect flying machine. The peregrine is a supreme hunter, a masterpiece of aerodynamic design. Its strategy, a mixture of surprise and speed. Hurtling out of the sun, the stoop may achieve a dazzling 100 miles per hour. It is just as capable of striking down a speeding grouse by sheer wing power. the prey will be brought back to the nest site where three chicks are preparing for their first flight. Even at this tender age, their hunting potential is obvious. And because peregrines have been coveted by falconers for centuries, and still are, these chicks might have been stolen from the nest. Even in adulthood, they face further problems. For grouse shooting humans don't like grouse eating birds and peregrines are often shot. Their survival hangs in the balance and never more so than when scrambling away from the nest for the first time. To encourage the chicks to fly, the adults purposely starve them and they become frantic with hunger.
Only when desperation makes the chicks risk injury will the adults intervene. When at last the male brings food, he provokes an aggressive scramble, a case of first come, first served. Over a period of two or three days, it becomes obvious to the fledglings that mobility is the key to survival. So learning to fly becomes an imperative. Their first attempts are not as graceful as the encouraging example given by their mother. But practice makes perfect, or not so perfect. To see three fledglings approaching maturity is encouraging. And in many areas, peregrines are increasing, recovering from the catastrophic era of environmental poisoning, when peregrine numbers crashed to record lows. The deadliest pesticides have since been banned in Europe, but not worldwide. Now, their insidious threat is spreading to the wintering grounds of so many of Europe's birds of prey to the lands where continents meet. Islamic prayer calls echo over Istanbul. Once the capital of two empires, a city bridging Europe and Asia, separated by the Bosphorus. This historic gateway is a major crossing point for many birds as they travel the international skyways to the sun. This short-toed eagle is a snake hunter from Bulgaria, heading south for the hot African plains. Flapping flight is tiring for long-distance travelers, so whenever they can, they use thermals to conserve energy. These are scarce over the sea, so migrants make for narrow crossing points like Gibraltar and here, at the Bosphorus. Autumn passage includes these black storks from Poland, white storks from Germany, buzzards from Czechoslovakia, sparrowhawks from Russia. The skies above become a gathering place for travelers. The ground below likewise, for long distance bird watchers converge from all over Europe to observe this inspiring spectacle. These are lesser spotted eagles from Russia, just a few of the 15 to 20,000 passing here each autumn. And it isn't just foreigners who take an interest. The locals are also enthusiastic about the migration. And traveling birds and bird watchers become ambassadors for conservation, who by their presence encourage the Turks to continue their sympathetic attitude to wildlife. With winter approaching, birds of prey like the sparrowhawk are traveling because they have to, driven south by lack of food. The birders travel not just for a holiday, but to identify and count the numbers passing by. These counts contribute to our understanding of the breeding populations through much of Eastern Europe and Western Russia. And falling numbers give early warning of environmental problems.
Hobbies and honey buzzards head for Africa to eat insects, hawks to hunt birds, eagles to catch mammals, and some to scavenge, such as Egyptian and griffin vultures. But all risk contamination from the pesticides exported to the tropics. These poisons accumulate in the environment, are passed on to birds of prey in the food chain, and then re-exported back to Europe in the spring to adversely affect breeding success and contribute to the decline of many species. The lessons from the Bosphorus seem clear. If we're ever going to enjoy a healthy environment, we could start by putting a global ban on all persistent toxic chemicals. Otherwise, the miracle of migration will be a thing of the past, and the future for all wildlife will be bleak. Death comes in many forms. In the wild, cold is a major killer, and carrion feeders like buzzards benefit from the misfortune of others. In central Wales, the most famous scavenger and one of Britain's rarest birds is the red kite. Only in the sheep farming hills of Wales and Scotland are there enough dead animals to support large numbers of scavengers. And magpies, crows, ravens and buzzards soon home in on any victims of overnight frosts or snow. The red kite is a shy bird and awaits the assurance of other carrion eaters before deciding it's safe to land. Many kites have been wing-tagged for identification, for there is much concern about their poor breeding success in the tiny population. Once, they were widespread, even snatching scraps in the streets of London, but persecution drove them to the brink of extinction. Now, only here in the remote, unkeepered hills of Mid Wales have a handful of pairs clung on long enough for more enlightened attitudes to prevail but their recovery is slow. Even now, bad habits linger, and one or two red kites are killed each year. They're easy to shoot, even easier to poison, like several other species we persecuted to extinction in Britain. One of these clung on in their distant stronghold, the remote mountains and fjords of northern Norway. Late February on the Arctic Circle, a time and place where the weather can be hostile to all life, even fish. Fierce currents, driven by wind and tide, well up from deep fields, sweeping fish to the surface so fast they rupture their swim bladders. Rendered helpless, Norwegian haddock are swept ashore, providing food for scavenging birds but they will not approach until safe from human disturbance. First light is such a time. The dying fish attract impressive numbers of sea eagles, as many as 50 here, driven together by the punishing cold of long Arctic nights. Like the red kite, sea eagles are wary, and they won't land until crows and ravens have given them the illusion of safety. They've inherited this caution from long experience, having suffered ruthless persecution at the hands of Norwegian fishermen, who saw them as competitors, vermin to be trapped and killed. But in recent years, more enlightened attitudes have prevailed, and breeding is so successful that there's a surplus of youngsters and real hope for the future. However, 
Unlike the Scandinavian ospreys that recolonized Scotland during their migration from Africa, adult sea eagles never travel far from home. So recolonizing their old haunts in Scotland would be impossible without assistance. So man lent a hand, and more than 80 youngsters have been exported to the west coast of Scotland. And it's no wonder the Scots wanted them back, for a sea eagle is everything an eagle ought to be. An adult female stands nearly three feet high, has a piercing yellow eye, strong yellow talons, razor-sharp claws, a beak like a meat cleaver, and a wingspan of nearly eight feet. It's the fourth largest eagle in the world, and one of its more formidable hunters. the western highlands of Scotland, now home for the young eagles imported from Norway and a place to their liking. There is rich feeding for all birds of prey and peregrines thrive on the estuaries, which have changed little since sea eagles nested here in the 18th century. For peregrines, there are still numerous small birds to hunt. For the eagle, there are fish to catch. And it's a tremendous thrill to have them back in their ancestral haunts, successfully returned after the last one was shot here in 1918. The eagles eat a wide range of prey, seabirds, rabbits, fish and carrion. But the numerous coastal otters have proved an unexpected ally, leaving scraps for the ever watchful newcomers, though sometimes having their prey stolen when distracted. Sometimes the eagles even attempt to catch duck, but only with limited success. More than 10 pairs of eagles are now collecting nest material and trying to breed. And each spring, yet more demonstrate their approach to maturity with displays of courtship and aggression. A few pairs have already raised young, the first sea eagles to breed in Scotland for 70 years a cause for celebration, and an example to show that, given the chance, birds of prey are great survivors. But they're also vulnerable, not just at the top of the food chain, but at the end, barometers of the Earth's well-being, 
and the first to fall when things go wrong. In Britain, most species are holding their own, even increasing. But in much of the world, they are falling, and we should take heed. But are we? Perhaps we should remember that we too live at the top of the food chain, the ultimate predator, and see the story of the eagle's disappearance and return as a symbol of our own 